not tokenism at all. Uh, I would include, um, I love both of these films and would have included uh, both of them on any kind of course taught anywhere in the world uh, of, this, uh, of this kind. Um, but the topic is the restlessness of the dead, I suppose, would be the way to put it. Um, and what that means. And of course the first thing to say is that the dead aren't restless at all, obviously. It's the anxiety of the, of the survivors um, that is being expressed by the um, projection onto the dead of that sort of restlessness and unwillingness to just die and go quietly, so to speak. And uh, that means, of course, that the survivors feel guilty and are aware that, uh, that the death uh, that's involved is an unjust death. Uh, not that there may be a death that isn't experienced as unjust, but in the kinds of cases that we've been interested in, it's clearly associated with injustice. Uh, and more specifically, of course, uh, in the case of AIDS, AIDS itself is experienced as an injustice. A death from AIDS is experienced as an injustice. And the homophobia attached to AIDS is experienced as an injustice. And the social inequalities in general that AIDS makes visible, uh, recognizable as forms of, of uh, injustice and so on. So you get from that kind of double thematics this week and the week after, after the break, uh, the thematics of haunting itself, which is what I want to talk about today, the return of the dead among the living in quest of justice, which is what underlies both of the films here and Patience and RSVP. But then the other theme is, I suppose, what you call haunted mess. Um, uh, the inability of the living either to forget the dead or to remember them adequately so to find themselves haunted instead and, and the ability of the haunted survivor to, to, to haunt in turn to uh, the writing of the haunted survivor in particular to become um, a form of, uh, of haunting itself. So I wrote uh, on the board of a quotation from Rilke that's been on my mind uh, this week because uh, I'm uh, reading a book in French, the title of which is uh, La vie des morts, le uh, I didn't recognize it as a quotation from Rilke, and not surprisingly so. I, I had to be told by the book that it was a quotation from Rilke because the Rilke phrase corresponds to la vie des morts et des puissants. It's towards the it's, it's kind of different somehow. You know. uh, I'm not sure how to translate it properly, but we would say being dead is tiresome, troublesome, pain in the ass and detail. Um, and the whole of the first day, the, well, the, the whole of the, really the whole of the Duenes and Elegien, I suppose, the Duenes and Elegies is, is worth is important reading from this uh, point of view. Uh, but the first elegy in particular probably is uh, uh, it says uh, the angels have trouble distinguishing between the dead and the living. Uh, and of course, the dead are, are still alive in some sense and the living are already dead. So that's our cheerful topic for for today, all right? Everybody be quirky and upbeat about this thing as far as possible. Uh, okay, the two films are concerned with the specific injustice, I think, of uh, homophobia, and more particularly the scapegoating of homosexuals and homosexuality for the uh, calamity of the AIDS, of the calamity of the AIDS. And, um, they are therefore responding to a form of injustice which I would describe as the singling out of one group or one individual as being responsible for what is in fact a collective ordeal, a collective visitation. There's no one who's not affected by uh, this 
uh, epidemic this syndrome. Um, but uh, for some, it becomes necessary to do, do the singling out uh, of, uh, of someone who can be scapegoated, uh, someone or some group who can be uh, scapegoated. So when AIDS witnessing writing figures itself as a form of writing in the broad sense to include films in this case, uh, figures itself as a form of haunting, the haunting is a response to the injustice of um, scapegoating, and the haunting gets configured therefore as a collective haunt rather than not, not a singular haunt, the ghost is a figure for, um, for, a, for a plural, for more than one, as Stephen Dice says, and Spectre Marks. Okay, now, um, the rhetorical mode of haunting is, in each of these cases, a form of prosopopoeia. Uh, and we need to talk a little bit about prosopopoeia. to spell check crazy incidentally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't believe that you're, that you're doing what you are doing when you write prosopopoeia. <laughs> uh, you have to, uh, you have to learn to say it aloud too uh, with a certain dégagé you know, kind of air. Um, it takes good morning's practice. <laughs> prosopopoeia is, uh, strictly speaking, putting words into the mouth of the dead or the divine, or in general those who cannot speak. Um, so uh, fundamentalist clergy persons who uh, speak of uh, AIDS as a punishment sent by God for the sins of the wicked are um, using their uh, divinity degree as a license to commit prosopopoeia, basically. Um, and haunting then, haunting in the sense that I'm using the word here, haunting as a, an appeal to justice, um, is a prosopopoeic response to prosopopoeic scapegoating of that kind. Right? It's turning a prosopopoeia, uh, that's used for purposes of injustice, uh, in the hope of repairing that injustice. So there's kind of a weird rhetorical symmetry uh, there between the, um, the rhetoric of prejudice and the rhetoric of injustice and the, the rhetoric that's used to respond to it. Um, etymologically, uh, it's prosopon. <coughs> which is uh, like persona in Latin. Um, uh, uh, it means either a mask or a person considered as as a social personality, so to speak. Um, and the Pia part is, of course, making, right? So it's about masking, mask making, making a mask through which um, the spirits of the dead and ancestors of the divine are able to communicate with the uh, living. Uh, which is a religious function of masks in many, many, many uh, cultures of the, of the world. But in Greek, it probably uh, derives from the uh, from the Greek theatre, um, with its own residual sacred functions. Um, the place where the dead heroes relived the salient episodes of their lives um, for the, in the presence of and for the benefit of the instruction and catharsis uh, of the living. And you uh, probably know that the actors in Greek theatre uh, wore masks along with uh, kind of stilt heels, I suppose is the word, really, elevated footwear, uh, which um, which sacralized them, made them 
look more than human or ultra human, beyond the human. Um, particularly because the mask, wearing a mask, uh, modified the timbre of the actor's voice uh, in ways that we can only imagine now, um, so that it sounded eerie, it sounded uncanny, it sounded otherworldly, in other words. I don't know why I think this, but I always imagine that it made the pitch of the voice higher and more soprano. And uh, that's one reason why we continue to this day to hear the soprano voices, uh, you know, the train operatic soprano in particular, as sometimes being a screech and other times being something positively otherworldly. But the other thing that the mask did was that it amplified the voice, intensified its carrying power, it helped if you were performing, you know, imagine from East Coast or South Coast or somebody else in the open air, uh, you need a, a voice that's, that will carry. Um, and the mask did that, it, it was a kind of resonating chamber, um, and uh, so it was a device of amplification. Um, producing, therefore, a rather strong form of authority. I mean, this, the words spoken through the mouth really carried in more senses than one, right? They carried a, a load, shall we, shall we say. But at the same time, the visibility of the mask meant that there had to be a consciousness, you know, in the Greek theatre, for example, uh, therefore, that that kind of authority is dependent on technology, on technique. Greek sense of the word, uh, that's to say on acting, but also on technologies of representation. The mask is you know, an obvious form of representation of the human face, uh, but there's also the poetry of the text. And we can throw in rhetoric and figuration and all of those kinds of things too as being part of what made the theatre effective in the way that it was. But if the dead are speaking to us, but the dead can only speak to us through a mask, then it means that the messages of the dead are received in, in under deferral. Uh, they have undergone deferral and are subject to iterativity. Uh, they're indirect messages from the dead. And in that sense, rhetorical. Um, the, some form of technology always necessarily intervenes and always um, inescapably intervenes, invisibly intervenes uh, when you're receiving a message from the other world. Uh, sometimes you need a Ouija board, other, other times the telephone will do, you know. Uh, but uh, sometimes mirrors are used, but there's always an intervening techno of some kind to make the point, which is why the speech of the dead when its, when it, when it's um, vehicle is both up here, um, represents also the presence of death in language through the kind of interruption that's represented by deferral and, um, and, um, and the iterativity, right? the, the message reaches us but not continuously there is a discontinuity introduced into the act of uh, communication. So project project carries all those kinds of connotations and resonances with it. You can see them working in uh, two films, otherwise I wouldn't have gone into all that detail obviously. Uh, the other thing that to say about the present appear though is that there's a kind of symmetry between apostrophe, which we talked about earlier, and present appear. Apostrophe is a turning away if you like, from the living, um, turning away from those who are present anyway. Um, Prosopatia is a coming back to uh, the audience, if you like, uh, if you put it uh, that way. Remember the Derrida pun, le spectre revient, uh, le spectre revient en revenant, right? which means both it comes by returning and also it comes as a ghost. 
And that symmetry, uh, which is partly constructed by me, obviously, uh, suggests to me a possibility of perhaps, uh, you know, organizing a right, in terms of of its apostrophic character and or its prosopopoeic character. Um, apostrophic age writing would take the form of turning in the direction of age so that the writing becomes, in some sense, the writing of age, whether subjective genitive or objective genitive, which is what we saw uh, or would have seen if I hadn't screwed up uh, when we were talking about Pascal de Goose. Um, Prosopopoeic writing is writing in which the dead sleep. Uh, uh, marked by discontinuity, by continuity and discontinuity, right? For putting a slash there, continuity slash discontinuity. In other words, deferral, right? Um, so the dead speak of their death in the very, in the very language that they have to use in, in order to speak. Uh, and it's that uh, haunted language that haunts the living, because it's our language, but a, a haunted form of, uh, of our uh, language. So that's why, you know, t today and then next day I want to concentrate on uh, that kind of writing as opposed to uh, what I call that structure. All right? Thoughts? Queries? Mm -hmm. It's a long time since we yeah. had a rather interesting sort of middle ground use of uh, yeah. the return of the dead. Absolutely. Yeah. At the end, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, a bunch of guys just having a wonderful time pre aids on Fire Island. Uh, we follow them through various sequential deaths from A, and at the end, the last survivors go back to that beach and have a kind of vision of all of the dead of Fire yeah. Island who are still there. The dead are in black and white, aren't they? And the, uh, and quite possibly, I think. Survivors quite remember. Color, yeah. Some striking visual. You can tell that they did, yeah. 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 Long Time Companion is a very interesting uh, film. It's, um, it has the farewell symphony structure, of course. Um, it's perhaps the best example, but there is a back narrative. Um, and like many, many um, age films, age plays, and um, age, much age writing, uh, this. Transcendence, this thing of transcendence is, seems to be almost inescapable, particularly in English language um, um, work. I don't see it really so much in, in French, but uh, uh, in English writing it's an almost necessary accompaniment of, of the theme. In certain cases, now Eric Michaels is not going to be you know, and, and engaging in that form of sentimentality, right? You know. Um, but it does come a lot, I guess, uh, the more I think about it, the more I'm thinking it's not even English language writing, it's North American writing. North American production. I think of Tony Kushner, uh, Angel of America. Um, or uh, what you'll see at the end of, um, uh, remember when we when we get to look at Silver Lake Life, um, there's some very clear reference to the same kind of um, thematic there, and so on and so forth. Okay, let me talk about um, zero patients a bit. Unless there were more thoughts, comments. Um, I, I guess everybody's seen it, or on one occasion or another. Uh, I think of it as a gayification of a sort of Brechtian theatrical parable, uh, kind of, you know, gay appropriation of. You know, Brexists, Brexists, <laughs> Brex, Brexists, uh, Marxist theatrical, right? the use of music and dancing, right, to, to uh, make your point, so to speak. Uh, and of course, Brecht's practice was a similarly a generic appropriation of amusement theatre. Um, you know, the, uh, the cabaret, the satirical review, the musical, uh, basically Weimar Republic uh, kind of um, uh, stuff. The issue was Weimar Republic, right? Um, but so we're dealing with the trope of allegory, in, in other words, and the trope of allegory made made entertaining and, and fun uh, for 
how he's got this here because he, he wouldn't be able to talk better than I am about uh, what the humor is, what the, the jokes and the funnies are uh, doing there. In my uh, undergraduate class, they mainly embarrass the hell out of, <laughs> out of the kids. They, you're not supposed to be, you're not supposed to make jokes about serious topics. In particular, they don't mind making jokes about AIDS, but jokes about <laughs> Particularly the guys, you know, <laughs> 18-year-old straight guys. <laughs> what is happening? You know, when you pop a boner in the shower and stuff. You know. <laughs> Actually, the audience when I saw the theater was really split. Really yeah. Very yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it, does, it does seem to sort the um, the sheep from the lamb, so. Sort of boys from the guys who <laughs> I don't quite know how to phrase this. <laughs> okay. So there's an appropriation, generic appropriation going on, but it's um, strategic device is Prosper obviously, uh, bringing back uh, patient zero. Not bringing him back to life, bringing him back as a ghost. That's the, the important point about the whole film, of course. Um, the maligned... Uh, French Canadian, as it says, uh, Quebecois uh, airline steward Gaëtan Vigar, uh, scapegoated uh, under the name of Patient Zero, brought back under the name of Patient Zero, scapegoated as the man who brought who brought AIDS to North America. Uh, so that's why I gave you the Randy Schultz uh, handout, so that you can see a little bit. Now, I didn't want to copy the whole of Randy Schultz's book, which runs to about 500 pages. Um, but if you look in the index, don't look in the index under patient zero, you won't find him, but if you look in the, in the, in the index under Gay Tond you go, you'll find that he, oh, I'm sorry, um, he doesn't occupy a very large place in that book, the book is mainly about, sorry, people, I don't know how I encountered him this part. Um The book is mainly about, um, how um, business and business as usual, political business as usual, medical, scientific, research, business as usual, um, made the uh, response to the epidemic in the early years very sluggish indeed. Um, and so the story of patient zero is a very minor episode. And um, Schultz's treatment, Schultz certainly was a journalist and Schultz certainly um, reinterprets the CDC um, study in the direction of scapegoating uh, poor guy, guy Don Gar. Uh, but he does it largely through the famous rhetorical device of insinuation. He, he doesn't make his declarations. Uh, this is a particularly salient example on the first page there, page 147, a bit that I underline. Uh, it starts from just one tryst with Gay Tom, and then it ends offered powerful evidence that grid, that's gay related immune deficiency, not only was transmissible, but it was the work of a single infectious agent. Okay, now that means uh, it was the work of HIV, <laughs> right? But it's so easy to read it in context as meaning it's the work of a single person who was infectious uh, walking around infecting. Somebody active, yeah. That's right, a double agent, yeah, for example, yeah. And so on the next page I gave you the origin of um, John Grayson's interest in Typhoid Mary. There it is right there, in the book. Uh, but the last paragraph, oh, the, the, par the last paragraph on page 439, the last page is the, the interesting one because that's where the insinuation is made. Whether Gay Tond Hugo actually was the person who brought AIDS to North America remains a question of debate is ultimately. Okay, you know. That's the way you that's the way you plant the seed of something. So I don't really know whether it's the case. Two sides to this question. So he goes through the one side of the two sided question later. The fact that the first case of the could be linked to Gay Tom, etc., gives way to that theory. He travelled frequently to France, which as everyone knows is dangerous country too. <laughs> uh, the Western the Western nation where the disease of AIDS is most so Africa is there in the in the background, right? In that France is African colonies. And sort of the subsidiary Belgium former African colonies have been 
In any event, there's no doubt that gay can't play the key role in spreading the new virus from one end to the other. The bathhouse controversy peaked so dramatically in San on the morning of his death. Perhaps a coincidence. Was also linked directly to Gay Time's own exploit. At one time, Gay Time being what every man wanted from Gay Life, by the time he died, he became what he was. So that's you know, basically what uh, uh, Grayson was responding to here. Um, but in 1987, Schultz's little uh, excursion into uh, the politics of insinuation is bad enough. But when the press took it up, they forgot the rest of the book. And what the press said, the media and TV said, was, yeah, they have this book, which is about the first man to bring to uh, North American, who was a French Canadian. Everything else comes up. So the film is also responding to the, the journalistic uh, appropriation. At exactly the same time, uh, in other parts of the same newspapers, they were scapegoating Haitians in the same way. AIDS came from Haiti according to uh, uh, the media belief in 1982. And, uh, and so Haitians uh, led a terrible life, uh, as a result, male Haitians, for a couple of years, until um, it gradually became clear that the epidemic in Haiti had been brought to Haiti by uh, sex North American sexual tourists, um, rather than the other way around. But uh, there was never a lot of publicity to that effect. Okay. So, um, so the film is using you know, kind of a counter prosopopoeia, if you like, you know, uh, prosopopoeia against this form of insinuation, um, if you like. And I think that that sense of countering something is very important to understand the dynamics of the film. I see it working, I think there are three main um, self-reflexes, breasting stuff, two self-reflexive devices in the, in the film, two of which are about um, countering. The first one is the figure of the paper airplane, which links things, um, uh, links episodes and so on. Um, it's, it's an arrow representing the reversibility of the finger point, right? I must have suggested all of that stuff about school rooms and teaching, the story of George. Uh, so patient zero is blamed unjustly for the epidemic, but also ACT UP blames the pharmaceutical companies, points the finger at the pharmaceutical companies for being blinded by greed and being exploited. And so it works both ways, is the general idea here. You can point the finger at me, I can point the finger right back at someone else. Um, and so the, I think the key idea um, there is that finger pointing, that representation as finger pointing is always an act of singularization. Um, even when the finger pointing uh, doesn't work as, uh, as, uh, as blame, um, Richard Burton's problem is that he begins pointing the finger of blame at uh, patient zero. And then when he's enlightened, he turns zero into a hero. He becomes, remember, the, the slut, the slut, the slut who inspired safe sex, right? And it's at that point that um, zero gets disgusted. Um, it's that reversibility of, of um, representation but in the end disgusts him and sends him back into the other world. He gives up his desire to, to reach life uh, at that point. So, it's, so that reciprocity business is important. The problem being representation is never serene. Representation is always pointed in the sense of being pointing. The um, second uh, self-referential uh, Device, if it's a device. The second way in which the film represents the importance of reciprocity, reciprocity uh, is through the, um, the theme of the bombardment of images, quote unquote, the um, music, what he calls the music video approach. I think that's music slash video or music hyphen video or something other like that. That's what he's saying there. 
rather than you know, music video in the, in the MTV sense of the, of the word. Um, now that's what Burton says when he's talking to uh, his superior in the museum. Somebody who's a music video approach, that's what young people want now, um, right? So he uses the music video approach uh, in constructing his manipulative accusatory scapegoating um, representing the Hall of Contagion, right? But the film itself is obviously uh, appropriating the music video approach too in its own somewhat rest you know, kind of way in defense of the community of the scapegoat at least that's why Shahrazad becomes uh, yeah, Shahrazad herself scapegoated of course um, well, uh, she's become the figure for all the women who die in the, in the thousand and one nights you know, but the, it's the women who are scapegoated of course um, but Shahrazad survives the scapegoating by telling the story, telling a story. Just tell a story, save my life. And you remember uh, right at the beginning when the kid is uh, reading a text in French and translating it in sight, it goes, Scheherazade, etc. If she could tell a story that would please the king, her life would be saved. And then the kid corrects himself and he says, her life would be spared. And the text goes on uh, until the next night. Now, I've never been able to catch a glimpse of what the French says at that point, and maybe you will do, you will do better. But that, there's a key ambiguity there. Her life would be saved by telling the story, or her life would be spared just until the next night. That's very important. Uh, what can you do with a song and dance routine with storytelling, with entertainment? Can you save lives, or can you just have a reprieve? So it suggests the making, you know, the, the making do character of of self-defense, of oppositional self-defense against um, scapegoating, and uh, its inability, therefore, to cure the real problem, which is, I think, in terms of this film, the problem of representation itself. The film has a nostalgia, like Patient Zero's nostalgia, for a world in which there would be no representation, because it's a representation itself that is unjust. So it can't cure representation. Telling the story can't bring Zero back to life because it can't cure the problem of representation. Uh, the third um, self-reflexive uh, figure that I think is important here, uh, which takes us a stage further beyond that question of the reciprocity of representations, uh, is the Zero, is zero. It's the Zero concept in itself, which is very complex, I think, uh, the way it works in the in the film, but I'll sort of simplify it so that I can understand it a bit. Um, first of all, it stands for zero hour, sense of urgency, right? I was quoting earlier, what's the time, zero hour, how much patience, none. But secondly, um, that sense of urgency is combined with a sense of betrayal, a sense of exploitation, um, which is Randy Schultz's thing, incidentally, as well as the act-up thing in the film, uh, and figured by the, the new wonder drug that uh, Gilbert Sullivan Pharmaceuticals, this is my favorite joke in the whole thing, <laughs> names of the pharmaceutical company, in particular Gilbert Sullivan. Um, the, the um, uh, where was that? Uh, yeah, the name of the wonder drug, if you remember, is uh, ZP0 which translates as a bar. Right. <laughs> so there's the supreme betrayal. Right. The, the drug that is pushed as being miraculous it turns out to be just yet another money-making gambit. But I think zero finally, um, right on top of those things, stands for um, the desire to retreat from the ubiquity of representation find an alternative to representation. That would be what patient zero really means, right? Um, not, not the first, not number one patient, but patient zero outside of um, the, the world of, of uh, representation, somewhere in a world of, you know, in a limbo, the limbo that's represented early in the film, um, of uh, unrepresentability or 
practically invisibility. And that's of course why zero doesn't have a proper name here. He's distinctly not Gaetan Ja. Mr. Zero, um, first name patient, his mother is called Mrs. Patient Zero, as you noticed in the phone book. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's that zero that, that uh, Patient Zero chooses at the end when he decides he doesn't want to come back to life any longer um, and he certainly doesn't want to stay around being a figure in the Hall of Contagion. He wants to go home, thank you, and go home means going back to being zero, being dead in the literal sense in which dead people are really dead. Um, so the the insight here to Venice to be, I think, is um, that by the end of the film, we've worked our way out of Project Clear and to the proposition that the world of survivors and the world of the dead are separate worlds, um, and the separation can't in fact be bridged. If you're among the survivors, you're involved in the So that, consequently, in in life, in culture, uh, there is no alternative to the blindness that is the byproduct of representation, because representation singles out and produces blindness. And it doesn't matter whose blindness; it's the, it's the characteristic of representation itself. Um, but it's figured, on the one hand, by the by Gilbert Sullivan, pharmaceutical company, blinded by greed. On the other hand, by George's blindness, George's failure to see um, to see zero when he comes back as a ghost, um, and of course the story of George's loss of eyesight is seen the red and white. Um, so. Either we have a world in which there is prosperity, that is to say, a connection between the living and the dead. Um, but the price that you pay for that is rhetoricity, uh, representation, falsifying, blindness, whether, whether it's manipulative, like Burton's, or whether it's defensive and opportunist, um, like the films. Um, the only alternative to that is to live in a world in which there is no, there is no continuity between the living and the dead, and that's, that's an impossible alternative. I think it's not one that we want to choose. In every society in the world believes that the dead continue to have a part in that society, that's what ancestors live in. So the film leaves us with that dilemma, which are you going to choose? We get, the, we get zeros of choice and we are asked to make our own choices. So, uh, next point. Uh, it's really the last one, but it's a biggie. I think I can do it in time for the break. Hang on there. Um, let's go back to Zero's initial desire to come back to life before the end he decides he doesn't want to come back to life. Why does he want to come back to life? Um, he wants to come back to life to clear his name, as he says. It would be the sign that he succeeded in clearing his name. His name. Uh, but it has two components, there are two themes, if you like, attached to the uh, plot uh, device of his coming back as a ghost. The first is the theme of visibility. Um, he wants, he needs to be seen, because that would mean that he's not a ghost. Um, so visibility is used in the film as the alternative to representational blindness. Uh, and it stands for the desire for there to be something that would be a self-evident truth, external to the dynamics of representation. That's one theme. And then the other theme um, is the theme of the collectivity of scapegoats, of uh, the idea that those who are singled out for blame turn out to be so numerous uh, and to multiply before your very eyes to such an extent that they form a whole group uh, of people who can collectively make a claim for justice and, and 
struggle against unjust representation. So the desire for truth matched by the desire for justice, something called justice with quote marks around it, and nobody quite knows what it would be and we would recognise it. You know. But the, the desire for this thing, just as there's a desire for justice, and those two things are intertwined in, uh, in the uh, film. Which means that being zero has a negative side as well as has a positive side as well as a negative side. The negative side is at the end is um, zero's desire to, to go back to be in limbo, to escape from the world of, uh, of representation and blindness. Um, the positive side is the potential strength that's nevertheless inherent um, in in what in the loss of person the loss of personal the loss of prosopomness in the loss of individuality right? to become zero is to be patient zero rather than being gay um, and it's in that in that deep possession of self that uh, the secret of collective response lies because Individualization corresponds here to the singularization uh, that is a product of escape. An individual and you're being singled out. Um, now the, that tension, um, the, the double tension, the, the tension between the positive and the negative side of zero and, and the tension. Um, between uh, um, the desire for there to be communication between the living and the dead and the knowledge that there cannot be communication between the living and the dead is what's worked out in terms of the love plot here. And the star-crossed lovers are star-crossed because one of them is a survivor. See, Burton is the survivor to end all survivors. He must now be, must be about 180 years old at least, you know doing nicely, he still looks quite young. Very cute. Um, and, um, um, and, and Zero, of course, um, who is uh, the, uh, in a similar way, the representative um, dead person, um, can, can they form a couple? Under what conditions can they form? That's the question. It would mean uh, Zero's coming back to life. Zero ends up choosing not to come back to life. And so the love affair in the end uh, leaves the lovers stranded, separated. Um, now, how does this work out in more detail? Uh, I'll go through the visibility thing, and then I'll go through the collectivity thing, and I'll say a few more words, and then it'll be time to stop. Um, if Zero could achieve visibility, um, it would mean that survivors, uh, people like George or people like um, Richard Burton, would have learned to transcend the blindness produced by the regime of representation, represented by the whole of contagion. And that in turn, it seems, means uh, recognizing the other not as one who can be rejected, reviled, abandoned, quarantined, expelled, but as part of oneself. That seems to be the condition of visibility. Uh, the reason that he turns out to be able to see um, uh, zero is that there is a part of himself that is like zero that he is not that he's unaware of, that is, of course, um, his repressed homosexuality. So, Burton is led to acknowledge his own homosexual desire, uh, starting with the famous um, butthole ballet, dialogue of the assholes, a high point of good taste. <laughs> to remember this seminar by. 
which really worries my 19-year-old male undergraduates too, I can tell you. Um, yeah, there's, the, there's the evidence. You can't escape talking about that episode because it's the crucial episode. It's the moment when um, it becomes clear that um, the Burton is recognizing the other in himself. The other in himself is speaking up <laughs> and uh, refusing to be silenced in another. And, then, and that's, that's when they become lovers, right? Um, so, when that happens, um, uh, Burton not only, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Zero not only um, achieves the privilege of being visible to, Bert, to, to Burton, but he also is photographed, can be photographed, he begins to show up on the film. Right? Um, but, um, and so that looks as if it's heading towards a happy ending, which, however, doesn't occur um, because a Burton can't desist from the desire to represent. He's not satisfied just. <laughs> How was that for an ACB? Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. We, we're a great team. <laughs> the musical, the, the musical uh, duo of Nancy Peter and Roy Um Burton can't give up on his desire to represent. And so if he can't represent him as a, as a scapegoat, he's going to represent him as a hero. Okay? And that's when it all falls apart. That's when Zero uh, says, no, if you're not content just to see me, then I don't want him. Back he goes. Uh, you might think here of um, the dramatics of seeing in Charlotte de Beau, um, a, a series of texts. Or each of them end up saying, just to try and see. Uh, try to look, just try and see. Uh, she says, uh, the ability to see would mean uh, not relegating the ghost to the status of otherness, to, to the edges of one's perception, but recognizing that the ghost is, is, uh, is integral to oneself, is part of oneself, um, central to who one is. And that would mean, however, that things like age, things like us, which are themselves not on the edge, not peripheral to culture, but are also central elements of, of, of our cultural life, of who we are as, as a human being. Um, and that's why it's intolerable. That's why you can't, in fact, you know, although theoretically we're doing really happy with the opposition. The self is, is constituted out of otherness. In fact, the other is all the time being pushed, pushed to the edge because it's, it's an intolerable problem. So we, you know, I don't want to point the finger of blame at Richard Burton and say, "Poor dear, you had a great love affair going and you blew it." Right? I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is an insoluble kind of dilemma. Okay. So that's about the visibility thing. Now about collectivity, uh, I think I can be a bit quicker here. Um, zeros coming to an awareness of um, collectivity corresponds to Burton's evolution in the direction of recognizing his own constituent homosexuality. In other words, coming together with lovers is uh, Burton comes to understand himself as being constituted by the, the otherness of homosexuality. Zero comes to understand that he's not just zero, that, well, that he is just zero, and that as just zero, um, he is uh, one component of a collectivity. Um, so he discovers that he has everything in common with the other pariahs in the film, right? Both the members of ACT UP, remember that scene where they introduce themselves, with important histories of who they are and everything. And then the, the other pariahs, who are the occupants of the hall of contagion, uh, Typhoid Mary, the African Green Monkey, the, the um, passengers on the, on the plague ship uh, outside of Marseille, the um, victims of the Tuskegee experiment, and so on. Um, the film teaches us that, that, that those two groups are one and the same group by um, using the uh, the members of the AIDS, of the ACT UP group, uh, as standings for the, um, for the uh, George becomes the Tuskegee uh, farmer with his uh, overalls, 
and uh, Typhoid Mary is, is um, uh, right, she's called, she's called Mary Typhoid in, <laughs> in, her, uh, in her role as, uh, as a, a former air stewardess and member of ACT UP, but you see what I'm saying there, it's a kind of um, cross-hatching between those two groups of people. Now, uh, uh, Burton's uh, evolution seems to be something that happens more or less in spite of himself. Right? He doesn't know he's going to be able to see the ghost. He doesn't know that his asshole is going to talk to him and to make him love, etc., etc. Um, but I want to draw your attention to the fact that, uh, that Zero's evolution is a matter of teaching. He gets taught. Um, he encounters teachers along this, this way. Um, and I stress that because I think that another metaphor for what witnessing is might well be teaching, and we want to talk about that when we're uh, dealing with Silver um, Lake Life, I think. But, you know, the two main teachers are the African Green Monkey, uh, one of my favourite characters in all of filmdom. You remember her, she's the one who says, don't be ridiculous, right? Uh, uh, why should I feel guilty, she says, <laughs> right? Yeah, I said, you were the first. <laughs> first scapegoat, maybe, but that's all. Right? <laughs> you know? So she thinks very clearly. You know, she's a lovely character. Probably there, you know. uh, and then Ms. HIV, when she pops up in, in Zero's blood, uh, is his other main teacher, right? um, who rejects her own scapegoat. She's as much scapegoat as she says as anybody else um, here. She didn't choose to be the scourge of the human immune system. Uh, and so she teaches him to understand what the CDC, thanks to what the CDC investigation was all about, really. Right? It, was, it, um, it, quote, it merely documents that you slept with some men who slept with other men. It doesn't prove that you brought AIDS to North America. I wasn't the first, says Vera. You know, it's the typical you know, character out of Voltaire in many ways, as well as being a breast character, a typical Angie New. I wasn't the first, he said. Of course not, she says. Yeah, she's a great character, too. Not coincidentally, both women, incidentally. Um, so the, the role of the teachers is, I think, quite crucial. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's true, yes, you're right. Thank you. In one case, the African green monkey is, is a cross-dressed, cross-dressed as a monkey, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. What are we going to do with this? <laughs> Marjorie Garber, where are you? <laughs> when we need you. <laughs> I don't know what to make of that. Yeah. But thank you for that. That's a very important correction, of course. Yeah. Uh, there's an interesting essay that we've written about the women, the, women, the female figures. There's lots of interesting. Looking for a dissertation topic? Mm -hmm. With the, um, the cross-dressing women men thing, I mean, it's sort of an obvious Shakespearean sort of model as well. And I yeah. can't help but think with your patient Zero, um, the cipher scene in King Lear, where the Zero also, you know how he talks about I'm Zero on a cipher, you have to guess what I am, the fool says to Lear. And it has to do with Zero not only makes me nothing, but it makes me everything, which is nice with the collectivity yeah. business. Zero takes one and makes it 10,000, mm -hmm. 10, a million. Thank you very much. Yeah. It just might be a good reference. Yeah, I'll look it up, yeah. Uh, I'm sure you're right. I'll phone Please. <laughs> 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 okay, I'm nearly done. Um, you know, all of that ends basically in the two acts of revolt, right? The first revolt is the, um, when the, finally the denizens of the whole of contagion rise up in the revolt and bring Burton, strip Burton and, and Zero of their clothes, bring them together in the diorama, um, and uh, let make you take its course, um, so to speak. And then the second um, revolt, which reproduces the first in a way, is the zapping of the, of the Hall of Contagion by the actor. Uh, people, um, when they transform the Hall of Contagion into a kind of agit prop, uh, up agit prop um, exhibit displaying the, uh, uh, 
put doing positive health education, <laughs> right? You know? uh, and it's not accidental, therefore, that that's the point at which the laying of the ghost occurs, uh, which zero goes back back to. Between the alternatives, I'm going to choose the third option, which is to go back to Camp Ron. But the, the, those two, two episodes, nevertheless, um, in an exemplary kind of way, demonstrate the power of collectivity, collective action, as opposed to singular. Okay, now, very briefly. Nothing is solved at the end, or some things are solved at the end, but the two main problems um, remain unresolved. The first one is George's indictment of, of the act of people when he says that the political requirement of unity uh, means that act up folks can't recognize their own constitutive differences. Um, quote, people must never know that PWAs actually disagree with one another, he says, sarcastically. And again, we always know who to blame. Right? So act up is tarred with the same brass as Richard Burton on the one hand, well, as Richard Burton, I suppose, would have. It shares that same desire for there to be a certainty about what is the case. Um, you know, the play on the word positive. Uh, we have to be positive and stuff like that. That is displayed by uh, the same desire that's displayed by all the other scapegoats in the, in the, in the film. Um, so that's the first thing that remains, you know, that, that remains unsolved. You can't really declare the film to be agitprop, although it, it, uh, it uh, represents agitprop. <laughs> I see sceptical look appearing on a few faces there. Uh, second unresolved problem is the problem of the separation of the dead and the living that I already uh, talked about. That's to say the isolation of the lovers which remains unbreached. Zero can't return to life uh, even though as a ghost he can be he can, he can uh, the resolution of his ghostliness takes the form of laying the ghost, that is to say, returning the ghost to the world of the dead. There can't be a resolution in the other direction, in the direction by the, through which he would um, he would come back to life. Um, in other words, the fact of his death is um, is irreparable, and the scandal that the fact of his death represents that form of injustice can't be. And that scandal, I think, is, um, you know, to rephrase it, is the demonstration that death makes to us all that human culture is not everything. That there is another to human um, culture, which is therefore bounded. It has an edge. It's bounded, in this case, by, I suppose, the natural, um, um, a death, if you like, the body, and that boundedness is the condition of the possibility of there being culture. Culture can only exist as the other of nature, which can only exist as the other of, of the culture, and so each is integral to the other one, but they can't be identified with each other. So culture has to recognize that there is a boundary beyond which it has no access, no jurisdiction, no um, impact. In other words, what is really haunting culture is the knowledge that culture has limits. Um, like, um, culture is haunted by the fact of it. Um, perhaps in the end, um, one of the things that the film is most about, it's about lots of things, but that's um, the way I understand it. Great film. Which has an opening tableau during the overture in which animals seem to put one constrict can act a scene of animal life in the forest, very active kind of scene. At one point hunters arrive and shoot big fox. And uh, what was shocking to the audience was that the fox is like a lot. And these beetles and ants. Mm. It's 
should have sworn the point. But part of the message of the whole opera is that that's part of nature yeah. and the body, and that that's perfectly normal. We should be going, you know. Right. Yeah. It was interesting watching the response. How oh, very I don't know when they're back, but I'm getting so terrified by something. Speaking of a complete insect phobia, I mean, I don't, I'd rather look at a snake than look at a spider. Like, really. And yeah. I think lots of people have that. And bugs in general are, are truly horror favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's subject to that. No, it doesn't just humanize teaching, but it teaches mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. which is what I've always liked about it. Mm -hmm. But when you ionize the adjective, which can, which I think is what it does, mm -hmm. you create a different mix of it. Ah, does that okay. stop it from being... Uh, that's a beautiful formulation. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is the issue. What's the difference between adjective and teaching? Um, um, and what interests me about this is that takes a similar form, but this issue takes a similar form in, uh, in um, Silver Lake Life, which is about learning to see too. Um, but what you just said helps me very much to understand the difference. Yeah. Uh, it means I have to have a theory of camera that I... Yeah, and the camera has a function yeah. to ironize that thing. Yeah. But yet not a dual. Yeah, that's right. On a big how to, the exact model of what you're saying, um, yeah, how to, um, how to teach people to draw their own conclusions. One way of formulating the difference between edge and problem. And uh, uh, something to reread, I hadn't uh, read it for a long time, would be Susan Suleiman's very first book on, uh, it's about the Lohomont days, what do we call that? novel with a thesis, um, um, which uh, you might have some clues about, about that too. Uh, it certainly doesn't talk about camp, I know. Nobody seems to talk about camp, really. Am I right? Is it old, although it's losing Sontag? Yeah, that's that what that means! <laughs> yeah, sorry. She's been reflecting on that article, and I'm going to talk about time, because in 1960, you wrote it. She could talk about an apolitical gay culture in a way that once AIDS occurred, Yeah. 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 I haven't reread it either. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
through through an ether. Yeah. Uh, while we're citing uh, classical articles, you might want to look at the Paul of Triclus uh, piece. Uh, particularly if someone can remind me where to find it. Uh, it's called an epidemic of signification. I'll, I'll try and remember to look it up for next week. It's in various places. It's in a couple of anthologies. It didn't come there. It might be. Well, was it in the age number of October? You can always go to the to the original has been. Um, um, reprinted several times. Yeah. I'll look at it. Yeah. Um, I'll look it up for this. Oh, now I realize it's uh, thanks to Ian's intervention. Um, it's quite relevant. And I'm roughly at the same period as the as the original idea I've been doing. You know, it's, it's dated 1993, so it took a long time to make. Did you have five minutes and some class in the of slides of uh, it was the last show uh, as a joint, and it's a show by the uh, and representation of self. Yes. I haven't been in I just went around and think of it. I think it might, it's a, it brings up a question of representation of human rights. It's a visual artist. Yes. Right. Yes. It's um, great humor, and that's why I thought of it being a like this. When would be convenient for you to do that? Okay, great. Great. Thank you. Yes. Ready for a break? Let's take a break. Um, um, I think maybe Pat's still out there. Is he not here? He's suddenly felt the need for caffeine, probably. Um, Okay, the other way of saying what um, Zero Patience is all about is to say that it's an anti-romantic film. In other words, where the romantic motto was love is stronger than death, um, the motto of Zero Patience is death is stronger than love, right? Um, and I say that with a certain amount of caution about the film, but I do want to say that the relation between Zero Patients and RSVP, and can only speculate a bit better, uh, is that RSVP is therefore a romantic film. What RSVP is arguing is that love is stronger than death. Um, and it does that by um, describing Prosopopoeia as the uh, trope through which love demonstrates its strength over death. And by relating that strength of love to the defeat of homophobia. Um, but there's a catch. Um, and the catch is that Prosopopoeia itself um, achieves its authority through deferral um, and in that sense, through the presence of death in the, in the very language of prosopopoeia, um, prosopopoeia is a relayed message. Um, there's a relay in the message. Um, and the message is amplified in film um, through a whole series of relays. In fact, that's its strength. But the relay means deferral, and the deferral of the message is the sign of the presence of death. So it's a film about broadcasting. I mean, the central metaphor is the broadcast. Uh, broadcast is the amplification of, um, uh, as the amplification of a message through the intervention of a techne, again. But it's also a film that says love can only overcome death on the condition of allying itself with death. Um, as 
the source of its authority. It's the presence of death in the language of Protestant prayer that makes Protestant prayer so strong. Makes it uh, a, a version of, makes it a form of amplification. So a kind of equivocation happened here, right? Um, um, someone or something has to die in order for love to prevail over death. See what I mean? So, in the other way, Andrew has to be dead in order for the love message to function as, a, as an effectively prosperic counter message to the discourse of homophobia. Okay. All right. Was that? Does that make sense to you? As I say, you might want to watch this film again if you get a chance. I, both of them, I'm going to leave my copy of Zero Patients with Nancy if anybody would like to borrow it over the break. And do you still have the... Do you still have the... Oh, it's in my box. Dodie's, um, office. There's a sign-out sheet. For, for the Good Boys Shorts? Great. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just give, I'll just give this to... Uh, yeah, I'll put it in there. To Aphrodite. So that it's a okay. general library for whoever Yes, yeah, library of two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, no one can walk over. Because I think they're both <laughs> worth watching several times. As a, as a matter of fact, I think Pat, Pat has her private opinion about RSVP. But, um, we'll come to that later. I'll try not to leave time for Pat. RSVP. <laughs> 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 I think one of the main things to notice here is that the message of love itself, um, just to refresh your memories, um, Andrew, who was when the film starts, is now he's already dead and his lover Sid has just come back from the funeral. Winner, um, thanks. Um, um, Andrew, before his death, uh, called. Is there a real radio program called RSVP? Okay. Uh, called the RSVP uh, and ordered up a performance of Respect for the Laws. This is Berlioz's setting of Gautier's Respect for the Laws, sung by Jesse Norman, which, however, he owned. He already had a record of. Um, so it's, it was clearly intended as a self prosperpeer if I may phrase it um, that way. But I think the important point is um, that the prosperpeer doesn't have a single origin. Um, Andrew calls up the prosperpeer by uh, writing into RHVP, um, but then you have to consider Gautier's poem, uh, which is also a prosperpeer poem, because in the poem, a dead rose is made to speak um, from the grave and to declare its love in the way that Andrew is declaring his love to Sid uh, or reiterating his love to Sid. It's the rose that, um, that declares its love for the young woman um, who wore it to the ball and thereby killed the rose. And it's uh, in the first instance in thinking about this the melody, the song, that you can see how the amplification begins to happen because in the poem, the rose's voice is described as very faint. Uh, it's the speaking equivalent of the faint perfume of a, of a fading rose. Right? Um, just a little whisper. There are yours. I wish, well, I guess I don't wish, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad for you that we don't have more time. I would want to do uh, a kind of semiotics of amplification by looking at the way Berlioz has set this, uh, this, uh, this piece. But anyway, just briefly, that faint whisper that's suggested by the poem is very much amplified both by Berlioz's setting, the, the melody, the way he writes that melody, and by the orchestration, which is um, not lush, 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 uh, it's pre but, uh, but it's it's relatively, it's Berliozian and therefore it's very Russian orchestration. And again, by Jesse Norman's reading of the musical and poetic um, texts, so, so that 
there are two interpretations, basically, the Berlioz is an interpretation, and I guess Norman's reading of, of Berlioz, who has exactly what I was talking about earlier, that soprano voice that suggests the sublime. So I think the slenderness of Gautier's verse, those little, tiny little octosyllables there, and uh, it's sort of, I don't know how to say it exactly, it's, it's kind of the triviality, really, the mondanity of the Gautier poem, um, by comparison with the way Berlioz builds it into something massive and impressive, is, I suspect, one of the germs of this film. The idea of the film is the amplification that's going on there gets now re-amplified in the form of the amplification that's given to Andrew's um, message. Okay. Now I'm going to skip, because we're nearly out of time, a whole lot of stuff that I would have liked to have said about epitaph and obituary um, in relation to prose and repeat. The epitaph idea is in the poem right at the end. Et sur l'albac où je repose un poète avec un baiser écrivi, si si tu ne roses, que tous les voix vont se viser. Thereby, I think, asking us to consider the poem not only as a present period poem in which I wrote a speech, but also as an epitaphic poem. And the epitaph is curiously ambiguous from this point of view. For some epitaphs are present period, and some epitaphs aren't. The epitaph that says, uh, traveler stay, passerby stay, consider my fate, etc. It's post uh, but the other epitaphs, uh, you know, quotations from the Bible and things like that, uh, or uh, uh, other epitaphs seem to have their enunciatory origin in a living person, not in a dead um, person. And then an obituary uh, is clearly about the dead and tells the story of their life, but in a third person. Uh, you can see every day in the Globe and Mail, if you look on the back page of the, of the, the front section, there's always a, a longish uh, obituary. And always an interesting one, to in my experience. Um, so I think this film uh, works uh, to establish a kind of, of continuity here between the appeal and epitaph. Uh, in the, in the poem, the rose assumes the message of the epitaph. The epitaph is written by a poet, but the rose obviously tends us to understand that this is the rose's opinion as well. So it's a prose of a pig epitaph. Uh, and then obituary, uh, there are at least three obituaries, in my opinion, in the film. The first obituary is, uh, while the second stanza of the, of the uh, melody is being sung, the camera moves out of the house and uh, into a, a gay bookstore, presumably, or another kind of support center of that kind, where you see uh, somebody pinning to a bulletin board uh, a little cutting from the newspaper, which has the picture of Andrew, whom they already recognize, and the quotation from George Eliot um, about the way it comes and goes. So shall I join the choir, Invisible, um, whose music is the gladness of the world? Uh, Etc. That's one um, obituary. And then in the third stanza, the first part of the third stanza, uh, remember the camera moves to a bar and somebody turns the, the station on, on the radio and you hear rock music. And now we're in the atmosphere of the high school where there's another obituary, which is to notice on Andrew's door, Andrew's an English teacher, uh, saying he has died and therefore no class today, so to speak. Somebody has written faggot right across. And typically, not typically, but significantly, you don't hear the music during that whole um, episode. So there is an obituary discourse that is out of touch with the music, and an obituary touch, an obituary discourse that is in touch um, with, the, with the music. And the aim of the film is to, well, not the aim of the film, but the, the definition of what happens in the plot of the film is how Andrew's prepared message becomes obituary uh, with the kind of rhetorical strength necessary 
to uh, convert homophobia from its homophobic position. Homophobia represented in this instance by the father uh, sitting up grumpy behind his newspaper uh, uh, there while the one being played. Okay, so I told you it was in a form of a rhetorical device I just uh, adopted is called, um, oh, what's it called? Huh? Occupatio. Occupatio is one of them, yeah, no, I'm thinking of, what, what's it called when you say you're not going to do something as a way of doing it? That's what I just did anyway. I just said I'm not going to go into detail about, about obituary or anything I did. Okay, now let's go back to the, to the, to the chain of relays through which this message achieves its broadcast, but it begins as a narrow cast and becomes a broadcast. How does that happen? Um, uh, first of all, you know, just let me remind you what I mean by relay is this curious relation of this continuity. continuity. Relay is an interruption, um, but it's an asymmetric. It's, it's an interruption that presupposes a, a signal or something that uh, follows uh, from it. And and what's happening here is that it is therefore through relay that the broadcast, uh, that the message achieves its status as broadcast rather than narrow cast. Uh, uh, and just first of all, if you watch it again, count on your fingers the number of cases of deferred messages that, that arise in, this, in the 23 minutes of the film. It's an extraordinary number. Um, in particular, right at the start, uh, you have uh, the message taped to the mirror. I'm not an uh, not innocent figure. Um, um, and then you have the, um, the answering machine answer to the phone and that's where you hear Andrew's voice because the two of them are still recorded on that. Uh, then you have the message recorded by the person calling <coughs> saying how did it go in Winnipeg, etc. And then at the end you have the symmetrical uh, call also to the answering machine but you hear a new answering machine message in which there's only a on the phone. And this time it's the father pronouncing his obituary in my opinion. Um, um, we'll come to that in a minute, but I think when the father says, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to talk to you at the funeral, uh, making his apology in other words, um, <coughs> that counts as an obituary for, um, for, um, uh, for Andrew. But anyway, the links in the chain, independently of those cases that I just mentioned, the links in the chain would be, first of all, Andrew's own message. Um, broadcast by the CDC, uh, received initially by, apparently by the, by mere chance, by, um, see, unless Andrew knows that Sid is in the habit of turning on RSVP, um, then it's by mere chance. Which is important because it means that in Andrew's thinking, the message isn't directed to Sid alone. It's not just a person-to-person -person love message. Andrew's message to the world. Uh, and then the next important relay moment is when Sid, uh, his first response is to go and you know, put things in boxes, grab Andrew's clothing, pack it away, comes upon the sweater uh, on the back of a chair stops and thinks and he goes and checks that yes indeed they do own a copy of Jesse Norman's Norman Singles. Um, and what does he do at that point? He goes to the phone. Um, and that's the crucial moment, halfway through the film, and it's the crucial moment because it's the moment which reveals to us that he's understood uh, the metaphorics of broadcasting here. That the situation is such that Andrew cannot have intended it as a personal message for Sid. And so he understands what that means, which is he has to have, um, call Ellen in Winnipeg because he can't call the family direct, can't call the rest of the family direct, can't call Pop and Mom direct, they've snubbed him at the funeral. Uh, uh, calls Ellen and lets her know that the, uh, that the music has just played and that she can pick it up because it's time delayed. It's going to be time delayed in Winnipeg, right? Mm -hmm. This is 
whether geography of Canada is particularly important. You know, <laughs> I always claim that North America was this plan from the start, and it should all be done hor uh, vertically rather than horizontally. You know, and uh, his case where the horizontal arrangement turns out to be more sensible. Uh, so the message goes through Alan to the family. There's another um, relay, and then there's the relay, the CBC relay, which enables the family to hear it. The mother further relays it. She calls mum. She doesn't call pop. Pop's sitting there waiting for her to serve the sandwiches, you know. Uh, mum hesitates a bit before finally turning it on, but she turns it on. Um, so there's another little relay uh, there. Uh, and so it finally reaches the father, whose response is delayed. It isn't until a week later that he responds. And this is what you see is, I think, unreadable in his response to hearing the music. It's like, kind of a male thing. It's a bit grim. You can't tell what his, what his reaction is. Uh, it takes him a week to make his, his final response. And then, as I say, he makes it by recording a message on the answer. So the implication is that it's the multiple relays of this message that has given it the strength to oppose, to be anti-homophobic, the strength to oppose the homophobia of the father, and that the father's final response, uh, is the father's final RSVP, in other words, right, um, is the evidence of that strength that the message has achieved. Um, Now he responds not to Andrew. He can't respond to Andrew. Andrew is dead. He responds to Sid. Okay. Um, and it's in that sense that it's obituary. That's to say, it's now relations between the living that matter. Um, but they matter only to the extent that they are mediated by the absent figure of, of Andrew, right? So Andrew is, if you like, the referent of the obituary discourse which passes between the father and, uh, and, uh, and Sid. But in acknowledging um, the existence of Sid and, and apologizing in a slightly roundabout way for having stumped him at the funeral and saying, we know how important you were to our son, and, uh, those kinds of you know, family type things which have been heard of. There are so many funerals um, in the last um, few years. Uh, so in doing doing that, that, that the father uh, acknowledges receipt of the message. Now, does the message end there? Here's the question. Uh, <laughs> you see me coming. Uh, no, it doesn't end there. He turns it back, goes back to sit along with the, the links in the chain. But obviously, we're sitting there watching the film, and so the next question is, how do we receive the message, and what are we going to do with it? Are we going to relay it? Here I am trying to relay it right now. Okay, to relay it best. Um, here in my own way, right, right in my own ob obituary for, uh, for Andrew as best I can, in the lingo that's mine, this is not much more, more um, rhetorically effective than the father's rather impoverished um, discourse. But, um, um, so, so there it is. It, in the way that um, zero patience concerns the invisibility of the spectre and, and tries to answer that question, what would it take for the spectre to become visible? RSV addresses the problem of spectral inaudibility and gives the same kind of answer. The, the way the spectre becomes audible is through the character of the spectre as a spectrum. Right? Its ability to diffuse into a spectrum diffuse being a synonym for broadcasting. Okay? Um, so it understands audibility then as being a function of deferral, a sign of death's presence, but of relay, um, which is the realization of the spectral character of the message. Um, and conceivably, you could argue that relay 
is the is on the side of life the equivalent of deferral on the side of death right? passing on the message continuously in the earth creating a continuity in the message where death creates a discontinuity in the message so um, like the spectral broadcasting has to lose something somebody has to die or something has to die uh, in order to gain something what it gains is rhetorical strength. What it loses is, is something that it loses to death. Um, so, you know, the key words are, I think, diffusion on the one hand and amplification on the other hand. Diffusion of the message means it changes all the time. It's never quite the same as, same as itself. And anyway, we didn't know what it was at the start because the message is the actual, you know, Andrew's actual message is implicit. Um, it's never quite there. It's already a spectrum of, of messages. Um, so diffusion on the one hand, but amplification on the other hand. Those are the two, two synonyms for broadcasting. And prosopopoeia is the model for that effect, the effect of diffusion plus amplification. You don't get amplification without getting diffusion. On the other hand, you don't get diffusion without amplification. Um, when we talk again next week, no, not next week, in two weeks' time, I'll come back to the, to the, to the idea of the relay. It's the relay that I think is at work in um, the literature of suspended sentences, um, I'm calling after that uh, writing. But for now, you might want to think of the sweater as being the, uh, a figure of relay, because that sweater occurs twice in film. First, it occurs first at the point where um, Sid comes upon it and it's just sitting there looking forlorn and and he doesn't metaphorically put on the sweater he passes it on uh, he doesn't accept the message for himself he passes it on to Ellen and the rest of the family at the end